Now, this morning, we'll talk about question and answers about dating. There was a great article, I think Rick Warren wrote it, that I just read this past week. And he was talking about unchurched people. And he said kind of the new climate in the world. And one of the things he said in that article was 43% of the couples in churches are, are, are families in churches now are blended families. That means that they are, have been widowed and remarried or they've divorced and remarried. So what I'm telling you that is this. You know, when you get married, you think, well, I'll never date again. Well, you might. You might lose your spouse. I sure hope not. You might go through a divorce. I sure hope not. But there's a realistic chance, 43% chance that that'll happen and you'll date again. And when you do, this will apply to you as much as it applies to your 15-year-old daughter. And so we need to be learning, not just as students, but as teachers. So we can learn this, pass this on to our kids, grandkids, et cetera. And if you're a parent here and you got kids next door, the, the, a great way to do this is to go home with your outline and just go through this with your, with your son or daughter and say, tell me what you think about that. See, I've been your bad guy. I can be the bad cop. You can kind of be the good cop. And say, tell me what you think about this. You think Rocky's crazy when he says that? You know, does that make any sense to you? Well, have you well, as you look around at your friends, what have you seen about this? So it's a great way to train your kids with this. Now, today's we're talking about question and answers about dating. Number first question is this: When am I ready to date? So most of our teenagers are next door, but I'll say, I said to them in the first service, I have you know, every party has a pooper, and I'm it. Okay. So number one, when my parents agree that I'm mature enough to date, that I'm ready to date. Parents know a lot more than their kids think they do. You know, parents have been there, done that. Parents have seen other people be there, do that. They've hopefully seen some people get it right. They've seen a lot of people get it wrong. Parents have a good sense of, of a guy. A dad can probably read a guy way better than his daughter can. And a mom can probably read a girl way better than her son can. And so your parents bring a lot to the party. There was a survey done by Brigham Young University and Utah State University, and they found this. Early dating usually results in early sex. The younger a girl begins to date, the more likely she is to have sex before graduating from high school. It's also true of girls and boys who go steady in the ninth grade. Of girls who began dating at 12, hello, 91% had sex before graduation compared to 56% who dated at 13. So see the drop in just one year of maturity. 53% who dated at 14, 40% who dated at 15, and 20% who dated at 16. Of boys with a ninth grade steady, 70% said they'd had sex compared to 60% of girls. Of boys who date occasionally as freshmen, 52% compared to 35% of girls. So the so parents need to decide that you're mature enough to do this. Say, what age is that? Well, for somebody it's 15, uh, maybe it's 16. Billy Graham had a daughter get married at 18 and he thought she was mature enough to do it. For some people it's 55 or 60. You know, you've lost control by then, but frankly, that's about how old they gotta be before they're mature enough to do this. Number two, I'm ready to date when I realize the seriousness of dating. When I realize the seriousness of dating. What you experience in dating lays the foundation for your marriage. What happens to you when you're dating has everything to do with how you'll relate to your mate when you marry. And so dating is serious business. One reason, because if you get sexually involved, you got sexually transmitted diseases. Some of them will kill you. Some of them will sterilize you. And then some of them will just mess you up for the rest of your life. And then you got the whole issue of are you going to be safe? Listen to this. Many rapes, uh, more rapes actually occur on dates than are instigated by strangers. One study showed that 90% of the victims previously knew their assailants. See, what we think is dating happens or rape happens when some girl's jogging on a greenway by herself and some bad guy jumps out of the woods and rapes her. That's not how it happens. It usually happens on a date with somebody that they trust. In fact, 47% of those rapes were by first dates or romantic acquaintances. One in eight women surveyed had been raped and more than 90% of them did not report the offense. 
One in four girls on college campuses has been date raped. One in four girls in America has been sexually assaulted. Not completely raped, but sexually assaulted. This is serious business. And so some kid can't just think, well, this is no, no big deal. I mean, this is dangerous. And if you're a young girl thinking about dating, those, that ought to just scare you to death. And if you're not, you don't have some fear about that, you don't understand the gravity of what can happen to you when you go out on a date. Now, number three, I'm ready to date when I have written standards. Written standards. So I've got four things out of that. Number one, what type of person will I date? You get to decide. Now, one of the most important things I can tell you is this. Never date to change. You date to discover. You decide this is the kind of person I want to spend my life with. So I'm dating to find out if this is one of those guys or gals. And when I find out it's not, I move on. And then I'm going to find out if this is one of those kinds of guys or gals. Not, I move on. And then one day I say, yeah, this is one of those kinds of gals. Is this guys or gals? Is this the one? So you date to discover. You never date to change. Because you'll think you'll change somebody or you'll think they'll change once they get gold on their finger. And they do, well, they do change. They get worse. I heard this years ago, I about fell out of my chair. I, almost, I might fall off the stage when I tell it to you, okay? A woman marries a man expecting him to change and he doesn't. A man marries a woman expecting her not to change and she does. Now you can go to the bank on that. I'll give you something to punch your, punch your wife with about or your husband this afternoon over, you know? I'm not recommending you do that. But that's the truth. Women think that these men will fall under the spell of their love and then these bad guy, bad boys will become like Jesus. No, never marry a crocodile expecting him or her to become a teddy bear. Don't do that. So what type of person are you going to date? Well, obviously you're a Christian. It ought to be a Christian. And if you're a committed Christian, it ought to be a committed Christian. You shouldn't settle for somebody who just wants to go to church. Honesty ought to be a big deal. What about their work ethic? I told the, the high school kids, you have some kid who, I don't care what you about grades. <laughs> He's going to be a bore. You know, you're going to be spent a lot of time talking over the years. You want somebody who's got a little bit going on up there. So are they interesting? Are they mannerly? Uh, are they trustworthy? Are they kind? How do they treat people like waitresses and other people? That'll tell you the real kind of person they are. How they treat people who are kind of beneath them. I'll tell you a lot. Are they respectful? How do they treat their parents and what do they say about their parents when their parents aren't there? See, what you say about other people says more about you than it does people you talk about. And so you find out about them there. Uh, are they, are they other-centered or self-centered? Are they servants? What kind of maturity do they show? What's it take to get them angry? What do they do with their anger? You can, you can set this bar anywhere you want to put it. You can decide, I'll only marry bald-headed men. Or I'll only marry men with hair on their face. You know, one of my deals was I did not want to wear, or I did not want to date or marry a hairy underarmed or hairy legged woman. I just didn't want to do it. Now you can date that person if you want to, but I didn't want to do it. You can do what you want with body art, piercings, all those kinds of things. Bottom line, listen, you get to set the rules for your life. I think people don't know this. If you're single, you can set the rules for your life. You can decide who you want to date, who you don't want to date, what you'll put up with, what you won't put up with. When you're married, in any relationship, you get to set the rules for how people treat you. They don't get to set those rules. You get to set those rules. So you set the bar for what kind of person you want to marry, and you'll probably catch what you're shooting for. So that's one of your standards. Number two is a second standard, or by the way, let's go back there. Yeah, number two is where will I go or not go on dates? Where will I go or not go on dates? First Thessalonians 5.22 says, abstain from every form of evil. So some people say, okay, we're single. Uh, we, we both have been married. I'm going over to her house and we're gonna uh, have dinner and then sit on the sofa and watch a love story. It's a good idea or a bad idea? Probably a bad idea. What they're going to do is end up in the bed and they're going to say, we don't know what happened. The devil just tempted us. No, we didn't. You tempted him. You tempted him. 
You should have known better. And if you're married or have been married and you have sexual experience, your, your temptation is probably exponential compared to the teenager who doesn't have any experience. Am I in the right room? So you got to have boundaries. So where will you go or not go? Going into that other person's bedroom, not a good idea. Being there when nobody else is present, not, not really a good idea. You need to do things where you can get to know the person. So you do things like, you know, a great thing you can do is play, play catchphrase, play Pictionary, play Scrabble. See if they got a vocabulary. Talk, get questions and ask questions. You know, do things where you're actually getting to know them. You can go sit and watch a movie or go to a ball game. Boy, he sure gets mad at the refs. Hello? Do something where you can actually get to know the person. So you got to decide what, what you're going to do with that. And then number three is what will your physical standards be? Your physical standards. In other words, how far will you go? All the way, quote, unquote. Just short of that. Seeing what you ought not see. Touching what you ought not touch. Making out, short kissing, laying down, sitting in, the, sitting in somebody's lap. What are you going to do with all that? Now, here's the deal. When I was at UT in economics, I learned the law of diminishing returns. So here you're dating, and, uh, and uh, you haven't done anything. You've just been going out, behaving yourself. And then one day you hold her hand. Oh, man, they're the electricity. I mean, your palm gets sweaty, your heart's beating. This is great for about two dates. And then you got to have a little more, don't you? That's kind of lost its zing, so now you got to put your arm around each other. And that's great for a while, then it loses its zing, then you got to kiss. And that's great for a while, then it starts to lose its zing, and you got to do a little bit more, and a little bit more, and a little bit more. It's a slippery slope. Now, we've talked in this series about this is, should be a Christian brother or sister. This is likely somebody else's husband or wife, and you need to treat them that way. You need to treat them how you're hoping somebody's treating the guy or girl you're going to marry. If you're some girl, do you want some uh, guy out there that you're going to marry being seduced by some girl? Answer. What? No. If you're some guy, you, 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 you want some girl, guy out there using the girl you're going to be married to? No, not unless you're an idiot. Well, what right do you have to expect your uh, mate to be treated well when you don't treat other people well? You need to treat them like a brother or sister in Christ. I don't know about you, but I, I never kissed my sister on the mouth. Ew. Now, I didn't always date right, especially in high school. But I eventually started figuring this out, started following the Lord, started studying relationships, started thinking about this. So I decided, you know, I ought to treat a person like a sister until I'm engaged to them. So there were girls I dated for months and months, and the, in the heat of passion, we held hands. So I, I, I decided I wouldn't kiss a girl till I was engaged. Uh, this girl that I dated, I think I told you about her, that, that she was from New Orleans. And I wrote her dad a letter asking permission to date her and told him that I, this was my standard and that I would never kiss her without, uh, unless we were engaged. Well, when she found out about the letter, her dad said, I don't know who this guy is, but marry him, okay? Marry him. Well, we didn't get married, but uh, that's, that's what we did. Explains why I got engaged to Betsy after nine days, but that's another story, true story. Some guys in the first service come up and said, tell us about you, how you got engaged in nine days. So I don't have time for that now, but we literally were engaged in nine days. But I dated lots of girls I never kissed. One guy, well, in fact, the guy who married this girl, Liz, at the wedding, I told him, if you treat her half as well as I do, you'll be, did, you'll be a great husband. I can't tell you how much better that felt than guilt and shame knowing that I'd used his wife. It felt great. Righteousness, you're wired for righteousness and it gives you an internal reward. Had, uh, had breakfast with a, a guy in our church who's, who's struggled with addiction. He's clean now. He's doing the right thing. And he's, he's just, he's a new person. And, and the joy of being the right kind of person is just spectacular. You know, I've said, be a, just beyond the way you feel is the man you want to be. So you, you got to decide what your physical standards are going to be. Now look at 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 to 8. For this is the will of God. So you know, a lot of times you don't know. Should I, should I buy this house or that house? Should I go this school or that school? Should I major in this or that? Should I date him or her? A lot of times you don't know. But here's one you know. 
For this is the will of God, your sanctification. What does that mean? What's going to tell you? That is that you abstain from sexual immorality. It's the Greek word pornaya, from which we get the word pornography. It means any kind of sexual impurity. It doesn't just mean, quote, all the way. That each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. That vessel is your body. Not in the lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God. And that no man transgress or defraud his brother in the matter. To transgress is to cross a line. You know you shouldn't do that, but you do it anyway. To defraud means you create desires in somebody that if they do what they feel like doing, it would be a sin. So if a, if a girl seduces a guy, she has defrauded him. If he does what he now feels like doing, it would be wrong. She's defrauded him. And look what it says, because the Lord is the avenger in all these things. Just as we told you before and solemnly warned you. Apparently he had talked quite a bit about this. For God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification. So he who rejects this is not rejecting man, Rocky, Coryton, Baptist, whoever else we put, but God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. I think I told you earlier, literally, uh, I may still have it somewhere. A, a single lady in our church years ago brought me an email from a guy that she had met at some Christian gathering. And this email was explaining to her that since they'd both been married before, they were no longer virgins. And since they weren't virgins, then this moral purity stuff in the Bible did not apply to them. There's a Greek word for that and you know it. Baloney. It's not true. And so all this, guy, all this guy wanted to do was be able to use her. And he tried to justify it, thinking somehow he could do that. No. What are your physical standards? And if you're a girl about to date a guy, you need to tell him right up front what they are. Now, you know, guy calls you and I'd like to take you out and say, well, you, there's something you need to know. I'm not just dating to play around. I would like to have a marriage someday and spend my life with somebody. And therefore, I have some standards. And one of those standards, just give them to him. One of those standards is, I don't plan to, to do this until this time. If you're okay with that, then yeah, we'll go out. And, but I'm giving you the option to opt out now. You can get rid of a lot of bad guys that way. And a good guy will go, wow, this kind of girl I want. So what are your physical standards? Then number four, what are your deal breakers? What are your deal breakers? So for example, if they, you catch them doing drugs, that ought to be a deal breaker. You say, well, they might not, they might quit doing them. They might not. And what about alcohol? I've discovered that people who don't drink have a 0% chance of becoming alcoholics. I think those are pretty good odds. I like them. Now, I know what somebody's going to do. They're going to say, why do you always say something about alcohol, but you never talk about gluttony? I can't tell you how many times over the years that somebody has messed up in a marriage and it started with, I'd had a little too much to drink. And then they had an affair. I never had somebody come in and say, you know, I ordered that extra hamburger. And, and then I just went straight and had an affair. I just couldn't help myself. Alcohol and drugs reduce your inhibitions. And you'll do something under the influence of them you would never do if you were not. That's why we're to be sober-minded. We're to be at our best so that we're not driven around by our feelings and our desires. Right, we ought to be governing those, not being governed by them. So what are you going to do with tobacco? You want somebody to smoke, drink, chews, those kind of things? Lying, cheating. If somebody tries to, starts to be controlling in any way, tell you who your friends are going to be or how often you can see your parents or something else, deal breaker. Deal breaker. Somebody scares you, deal breaker. Somebody's mean to you, deal breaker. You have your deal breakers. Remember, you're dating to discover. This is the kind of person I'm looking for. And the only reason I'm going out with you is to find out if you might be that kind of person. Because the moment I find out you're not, I'm on to the next one. I'm not going to try to change you because I don't have the ability to do so. Your standards and your deal breakers will determine your marry, who you marry. Now, number four, you're ready to date when, you won't, when I will not lower my standards, even if it means losing dates. So you say, you know what? This is my standard. Well, I don't think I want to go out with a girl like that. Okay. Or I don't think I want to be with a guy like that. That's fine. Just glad we got that straight. 
Now, second question I want to ask is, who should I date? Number one, y'all to date is, if you're a believer, y'all to date believers. Now, I put in your outline, don't date anyone you wouldn't marry. I mean, if you know you wouldn't marry him, don't date them. Just don't do it. First, 2 Corinthians 6, 14 says, do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? And what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? If Jesus is going to mean everything to you, you want to marry somebody that he means everything to. So obviously, and if, if, if God means a lot to you and you marry somebody who doesn't, that's going to be a real issue in your marriage. So you may be trying to teach your kids to do it God's way and, and you're married to somebody who could care less whether they stay morally pure or whatever else it is. You might even marry a guy who's patting his boy on the back because he's taking some girls down. And it's the last thing on earth you wanted your son to do. A second thing is I would date committed believers, not just churchgoers who say they believe. I'm, you know, most of the girls I quit dating when in college were girls that I decided would only go as far as I would take them if spiritually. So in other words, if I want to go all the way with the Lord, be a fully devoted follower, then they might be. But if I'd settle halfway, they'd settle halfway. In the, when, when I married Betsy, I wrote her a song, sang in the wedding, and one of the lines was, I wanted to, to uh, marry the best that there could ever be. I knew that meant a girl who loved Jesus more than she loved me. I wanted a girl who was, who was going to follow Jesus fully, even if I didn't. That's who I was looking for. In Amos 3.3, 3, it says, can two walk together except they be agreed? I mean, there's some things in a marriage you better agree on. You better agree about God and spiritual things. You better agree about money. You better agree about sex. You better agree about how you raise your kids. And if you don't agree about those four things, you got some real trouble. A third thing I will suggest to you is do not, uh, don't do missionary dating. Don't do missionary dating. In other words, this is a person who's not a Christian, but they're cute or they're popular. And so I'm going to date them. And, you know, we're supposed to be evangelistic, so I'm going to try to win them to the Lord. No, what you'll do is you'll get emotionally hooked and you'll end up in a relationship you shouldn't be in. 1 Corinthians 15, 33 says, do not be deceived, which means that we usually are. Bad company corrupts good morals. It's a lot easier to get somebody to sin than to get somebody to do the right thing. It's a lot easier to pull down than to lift up. In 1 Kings 11, you know, go back next time you're reading scripture, read through the Proverbs. One thing, you know, one thing I did for years is read a proverb every day. First day of the month, Proverb 1. Second day, Proverb 2. So you read the Proverbs and you get the young Solomon, the man full of wisdom. And then go to Ecclesiastes and you get the cynic. Everything's vanity. Everything's vanity. What happened between Proverbs and Ecclesiastes? Solomon married women. He read Second or First Kings eleven one to six. He marries all these women. He marries foreign women who, who served other gods. And it says that the women turned his heart against the Lord, and he did evil inside the Lord. It's easier to pull down than to pull up. If you marry some bad guy or gal, it's more likely they'll tarnish you than you'll shine them. Now, then the third question, last question, what should I avoid when dating? Number one, avoid settings that are conducive to immorality. Just don't do it. Ephesians 4, 27, do not give the devil an opportunity. I know people who claim to be Christians who go on vacations together and they're dating. They go on cruises together. Cruises are expensive. I'm pretty sure they're not getting separate rooms. And I'm sure some of them said, oh, we've got the same room, but we won't be doing anything. Oh, and we won't be stupid either, will we? Okay. Yeah, you will be doing something. And you are. So you, if you're going to be God's person, you've got to draw boundaries. A good boundary is far better than willpower. The devil can pick off willpower all day long. You say, well, I won't do it. Yeah. Whoever had an affair who started out to do that? Most everybody who has one says, I never thought this would happen to me. You, guys, the enemy has been dealing with your kind and my kind for about 6,000 years. He's way smarter than you are. He's way more cunning. And you have a default sin nature that got broken in the Garden of Eden and you were born with. 
and he knows how to use it against you. And so that's why we've got to be, there's, the devil's a roaring lion prowling about, seeking whom he may devour. So we've got to be sober-minded. We've got to be at our best. We've got to see trouble coming and avoid it, as we're told in Proverbs. So I've got to avoid any situation that's going to get me in trouble. Do not give the devil an opportunity. Number two, beware of being in love with being in love. See, all kinds of people just fall in love with the idea of being in love. Everything in, in our world's a love story. Have you noticed that? I mean, I remember in college taking a girl to go see Bambi. I'd never seen Bambi. Bambi's a love story. I mean, you see a cartoon, it's a love story. What's a love story make you want to do? It makes you want to be in love. So if you're going on a date, go see Chain Call, Chainsaw Massacre 3, <laughs> Saving Private Ryan, something else that you, last thing you think of is falling in love. You need to guard your heart. Some people say, I fell in love. No, you didn't. You took a running leap. Your whole being was determined to get in love with somebody. And so whoever got in your way, that was going to be the one. You need to have your foot on the brake, not on the gas pedal. You don't want to get married because of what you've done in each other's arms. You want to get married because of what God has done in your hearts. And you were just minding your own business, trying to be who God wanted you to be, trying to do the right thing. And this girl that you were discovering more and more, this guy you're discovering, you, you more and more wanted to be with him. You more and more couldn't imagine life without him. And you're crazy in love with him and you have no physical reason to be that. God has done it in your hearts. Number three, avoid talking about marriage when you're dating. You talk about marriage when you get married. So you need to assume this is not the one. This is probably not going to be my wife or husband. This is somebody I'm discovering. Number four, because as soon as you start thinking it's the one, you're going to start pushing it to marriage. Number four, don't discuss information that's inappropriate to your level of relationship and commitment. Now you're adults, so you ought to get this. But you know, in a marriage, there are things you might talk about, joke about that you wouldn't do that in, when you were engaged. And there's things you might talk about, laugh about, joke about that you wouldn't do when you were dating seriously. And there's things that, that you might there that you wouldn't do if you just started dating. And you wouldn't dare have that conversation if you weren't dating. In other words, there's appropriate conversation to appropriate levels of commitments in relationship. Number five, avoid talking about the pain in your life. So here's a guy who's been married, his wife died. He meets a girl who's been married, her husband died. They go on a date. And the first date, they start talking about uh, their loss. He feels sorry for her, she feels sorry for him. He pities her, she pities him. She likes the attention of the pity, he likes the attention of the pity. They're talking about things of the heart, emotions are roaring. Feelings are go moving quickly. No love is happening, but feelings are happening. When I was in Mississippi one night, a, a guy in the church called me, middle of the night, woke me up and said, my wife just told me that she doesn't love me anymore. And this guy was a deacon in my church. And I just sat there and kind of took it in, said, I'm sorry. And we hung up. And I laid there in bed about 10 minutes and I called him back. I said, let me just guess what's happened. You go to work, he drove an hour to work to Memphis. I was pastor down in Mississippi. He drove an hour to work in Memphis and back every day. And she worked there in Holly Springs at a bank. And in Holly Springs, I, I said, my guess is that she's working with a guy who's going through a divorce and, and, and he's hurting. And being a Christian, she wants to help anybody who's hurting. So he's been talking to her about his marriage falling apart. And they're talking about all these things of the heart. And you've been gone, you go from work, you know, you go drive to work, you come home every day. She comes home, wants to talk to you and you kind of push her off because you need just some time to unwind. So every day she feels pushed away by you and every day she's feeling closer and closer to him and she's starting to think that she's in love with him, not you. And he said, thanks for calling and telling me that. He hung up. Five minutes later, he called back and said, everything you said was exactly what's happened. Exactly. Say, so how'd you figure that out? Because it's almost always what happens. 
You don't talk to people of the opposite sex about their personal, especially relational problems, unless you're a professional with the biggest desk money can buy in between you. Say, aren't you being a little crazy about that? No, that's called a boundary. That's why I'm happily married for 36 and a half years and no blemishes on that one. A boundary is better than your self-will. When you start talking about things of the heart, you will start feeling emotions. It's like getting physically involved. The problem is you'll feel in love, but you're not. One of the reasons that arranged marriages work is here's one, you got parents who are determining these two people are good for each other. And by the way, they know a whole lot better than these two young people do. And when they get married, they're starting from scratch trying to build love. What we do in America is go out on a first date, have sex, create feelings, and then get married someday. And our goal is to sustain the feelings. And we can't do it. And so then we're not in love. You know, I mean, I love this girl. How do you know? Because of the way I feel. Well, two years later, they're back in your office. I don't love her anymore. Why? Because I don't feel the way I used to feel. They don't know the difference between love and feelings. So when you start talking about the pain in your life, sure, you're going to feel close. Sure you are. That'll be something in six months, if we're still together, I'll tell you about what happened in my marriage. But until then, we're not going to talk about it. I put in your outline, bond around your health, not your hurts. Bond around your health. Now, last thing, number six, don't try to rescue anyone. People have to make their own choice to change. If you marry a distressed damsel, what you get is a damsel in distress. And then you, in real estate, there's a term called the fixer-upper. You heard about that one? Which usually means it's a junk house, but if you spend enough money on it, it'll be cute, okay? Well, a lot of girls date a guy like that. He's a real fixer-upper, and they think they can fix him. Listen, people have to make their own choice to change. And your love cannot produce it. Remember, you don't date to change, you date to discover. Several years ago, uh, John Hanna, who ran RJZ for a bunch of years, he developed this leadership material and he, and he wanted to take a group through it. He asked me to be a part of it. So I was one of the people, Van Martin, an attorney in town, used to hear on the radio a lot. He was in there. Joan Cronin, uh, women's athletic director at UT, she was in there, several other people. And uh, in the course of that thing, we were talking one morning, discussing, and I don't remember what I said, but John Hanna said to me, he said, Rocky, don't you believe people can change? I said, yeah, they can, but they usually don't. And there was like this open gasp in the room because everybody knew it was true. Yeah, people can change, but they usually don't. So don't count on somebody changing for the better. They might change for the worse, but not for the better. So don't try to rescue somebody that you think you're going to heal with your love. The chances are after the marriage, they'll be worse off, not better off. You know, men can, will we'll perform. I know I've got to perform to get you to like me and love me and marry me. But now that I'm married, I don't have to perform anymore. This past Wednesday, I did a great message. Y'all need to listen to it online or, or get CD on how the oneness that the Trinity have is what God wants us to have in a marriage. It's probably the best thing I've ever done on marriage. And, uh, and the way you get that is you go back. If you've lost your first love, what do you do? You go back and do the deeds you did at the beginning. See, if you'd treat each other like you tried to treat each other probably when you dated, your marriage just gets better and better and better. The emotional temperature in your marriage is completely determined by how you treat each other. That's it. And if you keep treating each other well, you'll keep feeling more and more in love with each other. And the day you quit treating each other well, take each other for granted, start getting critical and negative with each other and all that, your emotions will go downhill and you won't feel like you're in love anymore. You've got to treat each other right. 